A couple things. Um, regarding the pulmonary embolism assignment, I'll hand those back tonight. You'll see uh, arrows on the front of your sheet. If there is an arrow pointing up, just consider that to be a thumbs up. If there's an arrow pointing down, consider that to be a thumbs down, meaning simply not bad, but meaning you need to do a lot more work. There were some of you that turned in that uh, rough draft with maybe half of the questions were not answered. So don't be surprised if there's a down arrow on that. It just simply means you've got more work to do. Thumbs up. Don't take that to mean that, oh, this is perfect. Take that to mean that right now, as of today, yesterday, Monday, you're headed in a very good direction. Just finish it off. You'll do very well in the school. Everybody with me on that? So if you're confused by what I'm saying, just speak up. So that thumbs up doesn't mean, oh, 50 points. It means that you're off on a great start. And as I just said, finish it up. Good things will happen. And many of you did fantastic jobs. Um, now, there is a question about if you reduced the radius of a blood vessel by 50%, what would happen to blood flow? And sure enough, that some of you fell for the trap. And you said, well, if uh, there's a reduction in the radius by 50%, then blood flow would go down by 50% according to Ohm's law. But as you should have learned, there's a more elaborate version of Ohm's law, not called Ohm's law, but called Poiseuille's law. And that 50% reduction in radius results in a much more dramatic decrease. So make sure that you look at that question and that you have the appropriate answer to that. There was also a question about uh, elevated troponin ions levels in the blood. Where are you supposed to find troponin ions? In the muscle. Where? You're supposed to find it where? The sarcomere, right? That's where troponin ions should be. Troponin ions shouldn't be in your blood. So how the heck does it get in the blood? because you have muscle tissue that's damaged and those sarcomeres break down and they release their troponin I and troponin T and troponin C out into the circulatory system and all of a sudden you see it elevated. So if you're looking for the presence of a heart attack, if you're looking to confirm or identify whether somebody's had a heart attack or the heart has been damaged, then you're looking to see if there's an elevation of troponin I or troponin T in the circulatory system. That's why that question is there. And the other thing I want you to think about is some of you answer, there's a question on pulmonary hypertension. And some of you sat there and said, well, if there's pulmonary hypertension, then you're going to have this series of events that occur over the long term, over the long haul. That's the wrong way to think about it. A pulmonary embolism is an acute event. We're talking about what's happening in the next day or two, not what's happening five years down the road. So you, all of you need to go back and revisit that question and make sure that you understand that when you block a pulmonary artery, all of a sudden that right heart is under additional load. And the right side of the heart is not built for overload, not built for it. So what happens is these people get into real deep trouble and they get into right side heart failure quickly. And I'm talking about within a couple of days. When you have that occur, you got an emergent condition on your hands, big time emergent condition. So make sure you take a look at those. There's a, uh, file that I posted earlier in the semester on blood and platelets. Make sure you go and look at that file. That information is going to be on test number four. And here's the outline for platelets and hemostasis. Hemostasis, you should have learned as a result of this assignment, is 
blood clot. So there's a PowerPoint out there. I think there's 31 slides on there, but it's not a lot of information. I will come back on Monday. I'll highlight the critical things you need to know. But go out there. If you haven't looked at the slide, make sure you do so. That slide, that set of slides was put out there well in advance in anticipation of the PE assignment. How many of you looked at that for your PE assignment? Just what I thought. Not very many of you. You should go visit that. There's also a new file out there, and uh, this was done on purpose, and that is, is that there's a file that I posted today on the American Heart Association's guidelines on pulmonary embolism. Some really good data in there, and you may find that useful in terms of finishing your PE assignment. Good stuff when there are demographics. Many of you nailed the demographics part of it. And so PE, PE events, they're not a rare occurrence. They occur pretty darn common. Okay, I think I addressed all those issues. Ah, yeah, there's going to be, I told you there tonight, there will be a thick principle homework assignment, simple assignment coming out that will be due on Monday night. Okay, so tonight we're shifting gears, uh, but let me tell you, let me just emphasize that even though we're talking about the kidney, the kidney is playing these incredible, uh, in this incredible set of roles. So there are basically five functions of the kidney, five general functions of the kidney. And you could sit there and say, in general, the kidney is kind of cleaning the blood, if you will. It's removing waste products and ensuring that the blood chemistry doesn't change. And as I mentioned to you earlier, the kidney plays a critical role in regulating blood volume. That cannot be underestimated because in regulating blood volume, the kidney is also regulating cardiac performance. How's it doing that? I already mentioned this to you, I think uh, a couple weeks ago, but regulating blood volume. Now we're into our algorithm for the regulation of cardiac output. And under EDV, I'm hoping all of you would tell me under filling pressure is blood volume. So everything that I'm talking about, we're going to tie into the regulation of blood volume. And next week, we'll end up talking about a pharmacological manipulation of blood volume using diuretics. What does diuresis mean? mean? It simply is increased urine output. That's all diuresis is. So why are we interested in, in diuretics? Diuretics increase urine production, which causes blood volume to go down, which causes filling pressure to go down, which causes EDV to go down, which causes cardiac output to go down, and now you're simply into Ohm's law, and if cardiac output's going down, then pressure is gonna go down. So diuretics are a very common way of trying to treat blood pressure. And there are four categories of diuretics that I'll introduce you to. One of these so-called loop diuretics. Second category, the thiazides. There are potassium sparing diuretics. And then there are ACE inhibitors. And ACE inhibitors, that stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. I'll explain that more on Monday night. But ACE inhibitors are not only useful in terms of treating hypertension, but there also appears to be a protective effect on the abnormal remodeling of the ventricles that occurs with chronic elevated blood pressure. And so, We'll have to add these additional drugs into that drug map that I gave you guys last week, except 
these drugs are not acting directly on the heart. These are not acting directly on the circulatory system. These are somehow manipulating blood volume in one way or another. And I think it's cool. It's cool medicine. There's tons of people out there in society. You may know some of them. You may have a grandparent or a uh, relative who's taken some type of diuretic, all to try to manage blood pressure. Okay. So let me go back up here. So just as I have up there, there are these five basic functions of the kidney. The first is to regulate the concentration of, it says elect electrolytes, but I haven't really used that term very frequently this semester. Just substitute that with ions, right? That's what electrolyte is. And for us, we could be talking about a lot of different electrolytes, but for us, the four critical ones that we talked about, primarily sodium, primarily potassium, primarily calcium, and occasionally chloride ion. But those are the, the four biggies that we've talked about in this class, and there are others. Number two, the one I already mentioned, regulation of blood volume. Really important. The third one is the regulation of pH. And come back to the mantra that I've used previously. Why are we concerned about pH? And the answer is because the concentration of hydrogen ions affects the structure of proteins. And by affecting the structure of proteins, we affect their function. So we're trying to control and maintain this nice constant environment in which our proteins can function and carry out their duties. And all of you will tell me that the pH scale is simply an inverse log scale. A normal pH of arterial blood is 7.4. We've got an endocrine function. Let's see, who in here is doing really well in class? Oh, Miss why do we, what, give me an example <coughs> of an endocrine function. Okay. No? Very good. She said stimulating the production of red blood cells via erythropoietin. That's exactly right. Let me just fast forward down the outline and I'll come back in just a second. Oops. One of the most important hormonal functions or hormonal systems of the kidney is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Make sure you write that in your notes. Put an asterisk next to that and sit and say, no, it does. This story, the story of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, is much like me talking to you about the O2 dissociation curve with respect to respiratory physiology, or the length tension relationship in skeletal and cardiac muscle, or the story of membrane potentials if we're talking about neurophysiology. There are these fundamental stories in each of these areas of physiology. And this is really one of the fundamental stories of renal physiology. So as I said, make sure that in your notes, you sit there and simply highlight the renin angiotensin aldosterone story and just put an asterisk and sit there and say no this. So that falls under function number four, which is an endocrine function. And then there's number five, which is the removal of waste products. 
So those are the five critical functions of the kidney. And I'm hoping that all of you would tell me that the basic functional unit, if you sit there and think about skeletal cardiac muscle, the mantra was what's the functional unit of skeletal cardiac muscle? Your answer is the sarcomere. What's the functional unit of the kidney? The answer is nephron, right? And there are millions of nephrons. I've come along now and I've modified our five-step model because the reality is, is that although I've just shown you one tube-like structure or one vessel at the bottom, the reality is, is that there's millions and millions of vessels in the body. They're all running in parallel to one another. And so now what I'm showing you is just complicating it a little bit more or increasing the sophistication a little bit more so that you appreciate we've got this heart is pumping out a certain amount of blood per minute. Mr. Martinez, you tell me that we expect a normal cardiac output to be. Ms. Valentina, what's a normal cardiac output? Of O2 per minute, right? 5,000 milliliters of mercury per minute. Of blood. Blood, 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 that's it, yes. 5,000 milliliters of blood per minute, that's right. And this 5,000 milliliters of blood per minute that's what the ventricle is pumping out per minute. But this blood now has to be funneled to, it has to be transported to different parts of the body. And here we're simply showing some of the blood would be going to supply the liver with its oxygen supply. Others, in this case now, would be traveling towards the kidney to supply the kidney with its blood source. And you can put in other circuits in there. You can put the brain in there. You can put the lungs in there. You can put all types of different circuits in there. So here's a, a very generalized version of the anatomy of a nephron. And we're going to say that we've got blood coming to the nephron via the afferent. Arterial. This oxygen rich blood that enters into the glomerular capillary, which we see this kind of bowing or the bending. That's going to represent the glomerular capillary. And in reality, it's capillaries. And then we have the blood exiting the capillary via the efferent arterial. And one of the unique structural features of the glomerular capillary is that it's got these large holes in it. What are those holes known as? Holes. Miss Stephanie, what's the name of these large openings in the walls of the Glomerular capillaries. Miss Merrill. Miss Lepard. 
Oh man, we're striking out here. Yeah. Orbs. Orbs. They're called glomerular orbs. So I'm going to represent these large openings simply by this broken line, this broken dashed line. And you're going to tell me that these openings are known as fenestrations. Wrapped around the capillary. Bowman's capsule. Coming off of Bowman's capsule, we have the so-called proximal tubule. The proximal tubule gives rise to the thick descending loop of Henle. which then gives rise to the thin loop of Henle. And hopefully you tell me that gives rise to the thick descending loop of Henle. which then gives rise to the distal tubule, which I'm drawing now. And then the distal tubule gives rise to the so-called collecting duct. So let me just uh, go ahead and label these. So here I'm going to put B, C. And you're going to tell me that simply stands for Bowman's capsule. Then we've got the proximal tubule. Here I'm just going to put P key. Proximal tubule. <clears throat> Which is then followed by the thick descending loop of Henley. So I'm just going to put P, D, L. Then we get the thin loop of Henley. Followed by the thick ascending loop of Henley. Followed by the distal tubule and then the collecting duct. pass on the thin loop simply because I've already got that written out for you. We've got TAL, which will be the thick descending loop of Henley. We've got the distal tubule.
and then we've got our collecting duct. Oops. Okay, if everybody would just look at the board for just a moment, please. So I can't show this to you. I'm not that good of a uh, artist for sure. But what I want you to appreciate is wrapped around this tubular structure is a capillary network. So I'll say it again. Wrapped around this tubular structure of the nephron, we've got this capillary network. And I'm going to represent the presence of this capillary network simply as a tube-like structure that spans the width of what I have drawn up here on the board. And we're going to refer to this capillary as the peritubular capillary. Peri meaning around, tubular, around the tubule component of the nephron. So simply the peri tubular capillary. And I want to come back and just emphasize for you a point that I've made a number of times throughout the semester. And that is, is that diffusion is not effective at the level of arteries, arterioles, venules, or veins. Because the walls of those vessels are too thick. So when we're talking about the movement of water, the movement of molecules or ions, the movement of gases in the case of the lungs, those are only occurring at the capillary level where we have basically a wall of a blood vessel that's only a cell thick. So that diffusion distance is very short. Not going to put all of it in here, but what's the concentration of sodium ion here? Okay, here you go. What's the concentration of sodium ion right there? It's 140 millimolar. What's the concentration of potassium here? Four. What's the concentration of the sodium ion here? 140, that's right. So I'm just going to come along. You already told me the concentration of the sodium ion here is 140 millimolar. Listen carefully. This part you got to look at the board and you have to listen very carefully. These fenestrations are large enough that they allow everything in the blood to pass through in the Bowman's capsule with the exception of two things, cells and proteins. Say it again. Those fenestrations are large enough that they allow everything in the blood to pass through in the Bowman's capsule with the exception of two things, and that is cells and proteins. And if that's true, which it is, then that means that the water in the blood and the sodium ions in the blood and the plasma are moving in exactly the same proportions. In other words, what's in the plasma is moving in exactly the same proportion as it exists in the capillary. So given that, what's the concentration of the sodium ion in Bowman's capsule? It's 140 millimolar. When 
What's the concentration of sodium in the proximal tubule? 140 millimolar. Here's a cell. I'm just showing you one cell, but there are many, many cells. Here's a cell that makes up the wall of the proximal tubule, and we're going to refer to this as a tubular epithelial cell. Part. What's the concentration of sodium inside that cell? So the nephron performs four functions. Don't get confused. Here's the first question. You gotta think of the hierarchy here. What are the functions of the kidney? Five functions. What are they? The first one is to come along and regulate the concentration of ions in the blood. The second is to regulate the blood volume. The third is to regulate the concentration of hydrogen ions in the blood. The fourth is an endocrine function. The fifth is to excrete waste product. That's what the kidney's doing. What's the functional unit of the kidney? The nephron. And the nephron performs four functions. The first function The first function is known as filtration. Second function, reabsorption. So just to use our diagram over here to the right as an introduction into this is that imagine if you're filtering all this sodium and it went through this tubular structure and it was all excreted, then your concentration of sodium in the plasma and in the interstitial space would decrease rapidly. So what's happening is, is that as the sodium is being filtered, much of it is being reabsorbed. It's being put back into the circulatory system. So that's step number two. That's just one example. I shouldn't say step number two. I should say the second function. Third function is secretion. And the fourth one is excretion. We're going to focus on three of these. Filtration, reabsorption, and excretion. We're not going to really focus on secretion.
So filtration, where does filtration occur? It occurs here between the glomerular capillary and Bowman's capsule. So here I'm just going to put F I L T. And you'll interpret that to mean that stands for filtration. That's the only place in this scheme where filtration occurs. Filtration is a process that is occurring between the glomerular capillary and Bowman's capsule. So now we've filtered our blood, and as it turns out, the rate of filtration is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. The rate of filtration we're going to refer to as the glomerular filtration rate, GFR. And I'm just going to simply write GFR. That stands for glomerular filtration rate. is approximately 100 milliliters per minute. Ooh, there's so much to know for that final. Mrs. Jones is going to show up and there's going to be a lot of data on her. Sit there and think about this. 100 milliliters per minute. How many minutes are there in a day? I don't even know how to figure that out. Peter, do you have any idea? How many minutes are there in a day? Uh, I could calculate it. There's about 1,200 just as a rough approximation. Yeah, no, maybe so. 60 minutes per hour times 20, that's 1,200. Yeah? Or is it 12,000? Or is it 120,000? Yeah, that'd be a long day, 120,000 minutes. So sit there and think about this. If there are 1,200 minutes in a day, and your kidneys are filtering 100 milliliters per minute, imagine if none of that was put back in the circulatory system, and all that's coming out here, none of you would be here right now. Some of you are kind of scratching your head, and where would I be? <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't figured it out, come see me, I'll explain it to you. Some of you wouldn't be in the restroom, actually. Some of you would be at a drinking fountain, or you'd be at Starbucks ordering, what's, what's beyond grande? Then they are a what? Trenta. <laughs> okay. <The Trenta. laughs> and you'd have a damn expensive Starbucks bill every month. Just imagine. But luckily our kidneys put a lot of this back. And as a matter of fact, the kidneys put back 99% of it. I should say the milk runs put back 99% of it. Or knowing that. You would tell me, Miss Daria, if the nephrons are putting back 99%, what's the excretion rate? 10 milliliters per minute. Ten milliliters. I'm looking for a number, not a percent. Right, 10 milliliters per minute. You said it. Reabsorbs 90%, right? You said reabsorbs 90%? No, I didn't. So that's a good memory test. <laughs> <laughs> I said reabsorbs 99%. Uh oh. Really so simple. It's one milliliter per if minute. If I'm reabsorbing 99% of 100 milliliters per minute, then I'm putting back 99 milliliters, which means one at the end of the day, or at the end of that minute, it's going to produce one milliliter of urine. 
So now you know we're going to refer to this as excretion and approximately a normal excretion rate is one milliliter per minute. I don't know, I think this is pretty darn impressive. So as it turns out, the proximal tubule is reabsorbing about 80 milliliters per minute. So the majority of the reabsorption is occurring at the level of the proximal tubule. We got about 10 milliliters per minute that's being re reabsorbed in the thick ascending loop of Henry. And there's about 9 milliliters per minute that's being reabsorbed at the level of the distal tubule. So that proximal tubule, all, all the segments of the nephron important, are important. So don't, don't uh, let me mislead you there. But just recognize that the bulk of the work that the nephron is performing is being done here in the proximal tubule. I don't know if you've heard this, but from a uh, nutritional point of view, there are some recommendations in terms of how many glasses of water you should drink a day. Anybody into nutrition? It's like a gallon. It's about four liters? Four liters. About a gallon. Okay. But. That would be a lot. Four liters would be a lot. About eight glasses of water a day. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm. And those eight glasses of water, they're about 1,200, 1,300 milliliters of water. How many milliliters of water do you excrete a day? I already gave you the number. How many minutes are there in a day? There's approximately 1,200. If you're producing one milliliter of urine a minute, you're generating about 1,200, 1,300 milliliters per day of urine, which means to replace that, I've got to drink about 1,200 to 1,300 milliliters of water to maintain a what? But it's a heart rate, it wasn't. The kidneys regulate blood volume, right? That's one of its critical functions. So if I'm getting rid of 1,200 milliliters, I have to be replacing that. If I don't, my blood volume is going to decrease. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about what's going on between the glomerular capillary and Bowman's capsule. I'll do that in a little bit more detail.
Okay, don't, uh, don't need to draw the rest of it. So the question is, what determines or what, what regulates the GFR? So if you're in a clinic world and somebody is interested in kidney function, they're going to be talking about GFR. You're always going to see GFR. It's kind of like the partial pressure of arterial O2. What is the PaO2? What's the PaCO2? What's GFR? These are very, very fundamental clinical values. So one factor that affects the GFR is the pressure in the capillary itself. And this pressure in the glomerular capillary, and I'm just going to put P cap. is equivalent to right around about 55 millimeters of mercury. There also is a pressure in Bowman's capsule. And this pressure in Bowman's capsule, just as I mentioned to you when we're talking about the pressure in the aorta, in the afterload on the heart, the pressure in Bowman's capsule is acting in all directions. Some of it's acting in that direction, some of it is pushing upward, some of it is pushing downward, some of it is pushing back to your left. And here I'm drawing a second arrow that is in the opposite direction to indicate that this pressure in Bowman's capsule actually works against PCAP. And as I have shown up there, I'm drawing that arrow a little bit shorter to indicate that the pressure in Bowman's capsule is not at the level of the PCAT pressure in the capillary. So right now, hopefully all of you would sit there and say that there is a net pressure, whoops, and this is going to be about approximately 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury. There also is a third pressure. And this third pressure is a hydrostatic pressure. I'm going to erase these two that I've shown here. And for this one, you got to pay careful attention and put on your thinking caps a little bit. And that is, I mentioned to you that these fenestrations are large enough that everything in the plasma, or actually everything in the blood, can pass through into Bowman's capsule with the exception of cells and proteins. So here I'm just going to put concentration of proteins. And so as the blood transits through this capillary, here's my question for all of you. What happens to the concentration of proteins in the plasma? Go ahead and say it stays the same. Okay. That's one possible answer. Is that the right answer? So let me just come back. So we've got this blood. It's now entering into the glomeric capillary. And some of it is leaving through these holes. What's leaving through the holes are ions, 
metabolites like glucose, water, but not those proteins because they're too large. They can't lose to those cells. And therefore, as the blood transits through that glomeric capillary, you're going to tell me that the concentration of the proteins stays the same, right? Goes up. That would be the correct answer. It does go up. But, but, the only way that can happen is that the concentration of water has to be going down. down. And now we're into a form of membrane transport that is specific to water. This dates us way back to the beginning of the semester. And you're going to tell me that the diffusion of water across membranes is known as what? Osmosis. Say it louder. Osmosis. osmosis, that's right. So now we're talking about osmosis. So we've got a capillary pressure that favors the filtration of the blood of the plasma. We've got a hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's capsule that opposes that. And there is this osmotic pressure that wants to pull water or push water. I forget which direction is the water want to go. Does the water want to go into Bowman's capsule or does it want to come back into the glomerular capillary as the blood transits through this glomerular capillary? Hopefully you'd sit there and say that this third force, which we're going to refer to as high cap, that's the osmotic influence of the concentration of these proteins. Okay, here's how the game goes uh, on the 20th. Me, Miss Los Angeles. Uh, you're at a bar with a friend and you're drinking your little Pellegrino and you notice that there is some person across the way there pounding down lots of beers. And being the physiologist that you are, you're sitting there going, wow, that person's blood volume is really going to expand a lot. That's what you're doing in this part. You're thinking purely physiology. <laughs> and because you're now a physiologist and you know blood volume's gone up, what's happening to cardiac output? Uh, how did you figure that out? Okay. So I don't know if you guys heard what she said. This is exactly what she said. If you increase your blood volume, then by definition, the filling pressure is going to go up. I heard you say that, right? And then you said that EDV will go up, which will cause stroke volume to go up. And if stroke volume goes up, cardiac output will go up. And if cardiac output goes up, then what will happen to pressure in the circulatory system? Go it'll up. go up. What would you predict will happen to pressure here? What will happen to P-cap? P-cap will go up. What will happen to the rate of filtration? It will go up. And without getting into more detail yet, if the filtration rate goes up, we're going to expect that the excretion rate is going up. You sit there and turn to your friend and go, you know what? I'll bet you in about 30 minutes that person is going to get up and go to the restroom because the excretion rate has gone up. Why has the excretion rate gone up? Because we're trying to regulate our blood pressure and our blood volume. And you guys now know that normal cardiac output is 5,000 milliliters of blood per minute. What's a normal blood volume? 
have any EMT folks here? Wood volume, normal wood volume is what? 50 ml, 60 ml, 1,000 ml. How about five liters, 5,000 ml? Turns out your normal blood volume is about five liters. Put that down in your notes. Normal blood volume is five liters. Anyways, so if we get our blood volume up, we're going to get cardiac output up, we're going to get the pressure in the circulatory system up, we're going to increase filtration. That will lead to a correction to reduce blood volume by increasing the excretion rate. I'll come back on Monday night and talk about the Starling forces. I'm not going to get to that part tonight. So we're going to begin to develop an equation, and it's going to say the following. It's going to say that the rate of excretion This will be in milliliter, oops, won't go there yet. The rate of excretion of X, X is a wild card, could be whatever we want to talk about. So I'm just going to put in brackets down below. We've got the rate of excretion of substance X, and that is equal to, I forget. Ms. Guadalupe, can you help me out? The rate of excretion is equal to what? Okay, that's good. I'm looking for a formula. I'm sorry, I should have prefaced it with that. Fantastic, excellent, very good. She said that the rate of excretion of substance X is going to be equal to the rate of filtration for that particular substance minus its reabsorption. So here we're going to put filtration rate of X minus the reabsorption rate of substance X. Actually, I shouldn't even put brackets around. Sorry about that. Now, what determines the filtration rate? So what I'm developing is I'm developing an algorithm, <laughs> just like I did for cardiac output. So hopefully all of you would tell me that the filtration rate 
of anything is determined by these three forces. We've got P cap. That's on pressure in the glomeric capillary. Pressure in Bowman's capsule and pi cap. So if P cap goes up, by definition, you would say if nothing else changed, you'd sit there and say that the filtration rate of that particular substance goes up and the rate of excretion for that particular substance will go up. And of course, just the opposite is true. So if P cap went down, by definition, the filtration rate for that particular substance would go down, as would the rate of excretion. If the pressure in Bowman's capsule went up, hopefully all of you would tell me that the filtration rate would go down. That's exactly right. Very good. If we sat there and said that pi cap increase, all of you hopefully would tell me that the filtration rate would decrease, right? Okay, so we're coming back to our story of sodium. We know that the concentration of sodium in the glomerular capillary is going to be 140 millimolar. We know that sodium is passing into Bowman's capsule in exactly the same proportion that existed in the glomeri capillary. And therefore, you would sit there and predict that the concentration of sodium on this side should be 140 millimolar. And we would predict that the concentration of sodium in the proximal tubule would be right around 140 millimolar. The concentration of the peritubular capillary is what I already talked about. You would say it would be at 140 millimolar. The concentration of sodium in the interstitial space, the space between cells, Ms. Miriam, what's the concentration of sodium outside cells? 14. 14. You agree with that, right? 4. It's 4, right? No, it's 1. 1 micromolar. 1 millimolar. Oh, man, I'm being so confused. But hopefully I won't be confused from the 20. Maybe I misheard you. You said it's 140 millimolar, did you say that? What are you guys going to tell me? What's the concentration of sodium outside the cells of your body? 140 millimolar. Miss Miriam, back to you. Hello, Miss Miriam. What's the concentration of sodium inside that? peritubular epithelial cell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right here. This tubular epithelial cell. 140, right? Anybody going to help her out? So the question is, how are we going to get all this sodium back into the circulatory system? So now we're back. 
beginning part of the class, we're into membrane transport. And you guys are going to tell me that within the membrane of the cell, there are sodium ion channels. And these sodium ion channels allow sodium to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And so if that's the case, then sodium is going to move from the distal tubule into the cell. Johnny Park, that sodium goes in the cell, and that's okay, right? Because it's just a few sodium ions, what's the harm? What are the fundamental principles of physiology? Do you remember any of those? Homeostasis, equilibrium. Structure determines function, that would be one out of one. Homeostasis, I forget, what does that mean? So when sodium moves in, it will change the concentration inside the tubular helium cell, and that will disrupt the whole So the sodium will move into the cell, and that will make the cell happy, right? Homeostasis says that our cell, our body, is constantly trying to maintain a constant internal state. So that cell, as soon as sodium comes into the cell, the cell has to get rid of sodium. Miss Francis, how is it going to do that? That's exactly right. Now, sit there and think about this. Is that just back about two weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer, the question that I presented to you is, what's responsible for regulating the production of red blood cells? Personally, me as a student, I don't think I'd ever guess. It's the kidney doing that. But when you appreciate what the kidneys do, then you go, yeah, I kind of get why they would be doing that. Because the kidneys are doing a ton of work in terms of trying to reabsorb sodium ions. And so they have got this very high need for oxygen. So sodium comes into the cell through this sodium ion channel, and the cell has to try to maintain homeostasis, so it can't allow the sodium concentration to build up. So as Francis properly said, there are these sodium potassium ATPase pumps that are pumping sodium out of the cell And now, as soon as the sodium is pumped out of the cell, what happens to the concentration of sodium here in the interstitial space? It goes up. And now, the concentration of sodium is greater here than it is here. And so sodium simply continues its little re journey and is reabsorbed back into the circulatory system. So here's a general rule, a general rule. There are exceptions, but a general rule. And you guys are going to come away and sit there and say the reabsorption of everything is length 
to the reabsorption of sodium. So the reabsorption of everything we're going to say is linked to the reabsorption of sodium. Here's one example for you to all think about. Is that as soon as sodium moves, if everybody would just look at the board for a moment, please. As soon as sodium moves from the lumen of the proximal tubule into this cell, what happened to the concentration of water here? Say it again. As soon as, as, soon as a sodium ion moves from the lumen of the proximal tubule into the cell, what happened to the concentration of water here? The concentration of water went up. The concentration of water went up. And the concentration of water here went down. So what's following sodium? Water. Water is going wherever sodium is going. So the reabsorption of sodium in this example is linked let me back up. The reabsorption of water is linked to the reabsorption of sodium. That's pretty cool, don't you think? I think it's pretty neat. One more story for tonight, and then we'll call it quits. Oh, you know, as I get older, I mean, my memory is just like getting totally shot. Mine too. So maybe you guys can help me. <laughs> Let's see here. Where's Nick tonight? There you are, Nick. Nick, I forget. Uh, help me out here. What's the concentration of glucose in the blood? Um, if you forget, you can pass to any one of your favorite classmates. Hundred. Hundred grams of glucose. What? Wow, that's like a midnight binge for like <laughs> twenty hours straight at Krispy Kreme. That person actually, Nick, just to help you out here, that's not called blood. That's called syrup. Okay. <laughs> So what do you think? Do you think you got the answer right or do you think you're off a little bit? hundred milligrams. Very good. So there's a hundred milligrams of glucose per 100 milliliters of blood. I forget. This is blue. What is a normal GFR? A hundred milliliters per minute, that's correct. Here's a question for all of you. Get out a calculator. How much glucose do you filter per day? Question is, how much glucose do you filter every day?
Filtering's right there, isn't it? Because you're going through 100 milliliters of blood per minute. So it'd be 100 times 60 times 24, right? 144. Is it this? It seems like a lot of sugar, but a lot of heat. Yeah, that's what I mean. Miss Annie, you got a number for me? No. no? Mr. Sebastian, how about you? Uh, 100 milligrams of glucose per minute. Yeah, my question was, how many, per how day. much glucose do you filter per day, right? That was my question. It's 144 grams, right? 144 grams. You got approximately 120 per day. How much? Yeah, uh, we'll make the number a little bit larger than that. How about 180 grams of glucose per day? You know, that's a really fascinating number because earlier in the semester you were asked to do a chemistry assignment and actually calculate the molecular weight of glucose. Ms. Demon, what is a molecular weight for glucose? Uh, I'm Miss Miss Aurora. Miss mm -hmm. Blue. Miss Justine. Miss Stephanie. Miss Daria. Mm -hmm. It turns out the molecular weight for glucose is 180 grams. That's 6.02 times 10 to 23rd molecules of glucose. Sit there and think about how amazing your kidney is. Every day it's filtering about the equivalent of one mole of glucose. And there is no glucose in your urine. I don't know if you guys caught that, but I'm filtering 6.02 times 10 to 23rd molecules of glucose per day, and there are zero molecules of glucose showing up in the urine. So that means that somewhere between here and here, there's a cellular machinery that's capable of capturing and moving 6.02 times 10 to 23rd molecules of glucose back into the circulatory system. Now, if you don't think that's a friggin' miracle, come see me afterwards, because I want to know what impresses you. You mean the lottery? I mean, that's a mind-blowing number. Now, if somebody shows up and they've got glucose in the urine, you just learned something new or important. Should there be glucose in their urine? No. No, there should and let me just kind of set you up for a lecture on Monday night. All that reabsorption of glucose occurs here. That tells you, coming back to the importance of that proximal tubule, that proximal tubule is doing a lot of really cool and neat things. Okay, that's where we're going to stop for tonight. Those of you who have lab, I will see you upstairs in a few minutes. Yes, there is lab tonight.